Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Happy New Year. Happy Easter. Merry Thanksgiving. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this morning. My name is David Willis. It's my privilege to be the pastor here at Forest Park. We are delighted to have you, whether you're here in the sanctuary, whether you're watching online. It is an honor and a privilege to count you in amongst this group that will get together and worship the Lord today. A couple of things I want to point out to you before we begin worshiping. You got an insert, something that looks like that with your bulletin. That goes along with the sermon that we're going to be sharing. Hold on to that. You've got a connection card that looks like this that separates from your bulletin. Be sure to fill that out and drop it in one of the offering plates along with your offering. Um, as you depart the sanctuary today. A couple of announcements that I want to share with you today. We welcome Jerry and Peggy Dean into the family of Forest Park United Methodist Church. They transfer their membership from Porterfield United Methodist Church in Albany, Georgia. They live out on the beach. Uh, Jerry, Peggy, give everybody a wave back there. They see them back there in the back. Hey, hey, glad to have you. They've been visiting with us for a while, and we are honored to welcome them into membership. Please be sure you tell them hello this morning. Altar Flowers, uh, where are they? Oh, there they are, right there. Uh, uh, given in loving memory of Connie Blake, Blake by her family. Hey, if you want to donate to the uh, recent tornado disaster up in the Kentucky area, you can do so. Instructions are listed there. Uh, uh, the special number is 901670. You can go online and do that, or you can simply make out a check, drop it in the offering basket, put that special number uh, in the note, 901670, and we will know where it goes. Big time tonight. Hey, big time tonight, 6 o'clock. Right here in the uh, sanctuary uh, in the evening of Christmas carols, you're going to get a little preview as we do the special this morning. The kids are going to come up and sing this morning they're also going to sing tonight so be sure that you come out and join us for that you may be sitting by a teddy bear this morning if you are please be sure hey there you go please be sure that you uh, pick that dude up and hold on to it while we preach this morning pray over it for the child that will receive it these teddy bears are going to the um, first responders in our area emergency rooms they will ride in police cars they will ride on fire trucks and uh, sit quietly in emergency rooms until they are needed by the staff there. If you would like to bring a bear in, please feel free to do so. Uh, make him no bigger. Will you hold that one up again right there? Please hold him up there. You go. Make them no bigger than those that are being held up right there because they are in cramped spaces. They're a delight to have, but uh, they have to ride very, very tightly. So make them tiny. Again, thanks for coming. Got Christmas Eve candlelight. Uh, communion service coming up the 24th at 6. And then pajamas and Pop-Tarts the Sunday after Christmas, December 26th. Uh, fun new tradition, wearing pajamas to the Sunday service. Only going to be one Sunday service. Uh, we're going to meet at 9 o'clock in the fellowship hall for uh, a light breakfast. And somebody asked me last week, hey, do I have to wear pajamas if I want to come to that service? No, you do not. But you do have to wear clothes. That is a prerequisite. <laughs> Please be sure you're clothed properly if you would like to come to that service. It's just going to be one service. We're going to eat a little bit, and then we're going to move over here about 10 o'clock for an abbreviated service. I want you to be able to spend time with your family and worship the Lord at the same time. This very important time of year. Uh, I believe that that's all I have this morning that I wanted to share with you. Wednesday night dinners will resume in January. No Wednesday night dinner this week or next week. Um, I want to call Karen Burrell to come up and talk with us now. Uh, we've talked very frankly about our financial situation over the past couple of months. And Karen has a little update. Karen is the chairperson of our finance committee. Ms. Karen, please bless us this morning. Good morning. As he morning. said, I am Karen Burrell, and I am so far still your chair of your finance committee. <laughs> we'll see how this year goes. Um, Thank you all for giving me just a few minutes and Pastor David um, this morning. Um, next slide. As I promised last month that I would be back just to give you an update on how we're coming into the end of the year. So here we are. Um, this is on primarily the ministry budget giving, the ministry budget giving and our looking forward to 2022 budget. Um, as we alluded to, um, over the last few years, the ministry budget giving has been trending downward by about 10% every year. 
Um, so it's 10% down and then 10% down from that. And unfortunately, through the end of November, that's exactly what we were doing here. Um, so we're trying to get to a catch up point. Um, wonderfully, the first half of December has shown a significant upward trend. Um, so keeping our fingers crossed and basically um, we are going to, though as we know, can't keep waiting on numbers and have to make the budget coming up in, in 2022. Next one. Um, but just to, just to put it back in front of everybody, when we talk about ministry budget giving, um, budget's kind of a formal word that you know makes most of us kind of shut off. But when we talk about our ministry budget giving, we're talking about what supports the work, the real work, what we're here to do, what the work of our church is. And what we're fostering here is it's not numbers, you know, it's not, you know, programs for the sake of big fancy lights. We're, we're trying to foster acceptance. We want to show that through hospitality, through fellowship, through, you know, hope. Um, pastoral care is part of our, our hop acceptance. We um, share our hope whenever we come together in worship services. We share our hope when we do outreach and missions. Um, and our purpose, we get to our purpose when we educate, when we educate and we you know, teach people to be disciples. Um, so that, that's what your ministry budget does, the giving. It, it helps us with the worship services. It supports the teaching children and adults. It supports the music ministry our fellowship opportunities. It, it does all of that and it does more. So next one, please. So in 2022, we're delaying any hard decisions based on that downward trend until we actually end up at the end of Jan at the end of December. Um, so we're waiting on those final, final numbers, uh, not basing it on an estimate or a trend or a weather prediction, but what, rather than that, you know, the real numbers. So what we're requesting today, first and foremost, please pray. Pray that, you know, the upward trend continues. Um, pray, uh, review. Review your own budget. Review your own what you've done this year and whether or not you need to play catch up. Um, and consider any unique opportunities like we talked about um, last month. Your required minimum distributions. Um, your uh, Go to Amazon Smile. I think they're still delivering for Christmas. And, um, you know, if you get the chance and you want to, go to regular online donations so you don't ever accidentally skip one. Um, so, but one thing as we go into it, you know, we, we've committed to following our normal process transparently and in full accordance. Uh, anything that happens will be done with through all of your appropriate church committees, uh, which includes representation throughout the church. Um, it will be presented recommendations to the full church council, and that's where you'll get approval. Um, and last slide. And if you uh, want to see this presentation, last slide please, or any of the previous ones that led up to this, we can, um, you can call me, my phone number is going to be on the last slide, or you can uh, look at the, uh, you can send it to my email address, or you can go online at forestparkfpumc.org and go to online giving, and you'll see it there. So um, I, won't, I won't even go into what those numbers are. Y'all can look it up online or catch me in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for giving me some time. Not just today, but over the last few months. And uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That's to prevent identity theft. <laughs> we, we, we protected your, your email address there, Karen. It's got another glitch in the system, Matt. Yeah, it's been hiccuping this morning already and continues to hiccup. So we'll get that ready. I uh, want to continue on with worship now through the lighting of our Advent candle. I would like to invite the Wood family to come forward and light our fourth Advent candle this morning.
Be easy there, buddy. <laughs> Grab that with a little gusto. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Yes, and we don't have the response up there, so uh, fake it. Just read the through it. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. The angel's candle is lit on the fourth Sunday of Advent to once again remind us that we must prepare our hearts for the coming of the Christ child. As we read the Christmas story in the Bible, we realize that angels are mentioned several times as God's messengers. Whatever your interpretation of the word angel, whether it be a vision, a thought, a dream, or even the thoughtfulness of another person at just the right time, we live in a world of, of miracles and God does speak to us today. We just have to slow down our busy lives and recognize his presence and constant love and guidance. We worship a God who cares so much for us that when we need him, he is always waiting for us to ask for his guidance. We have to trust God and, and try to see him in all aspects of our lives. comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. No flames, no burns. It's a beautiful thing. Thank goodness. Whew, they, they, I was more nervous about that than... They took turns. Yeah, I was too. I was kind of afraid that they wore their unflammable garments today. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you to the Wood family. Thank you for you for your patience. As we wrestle through a difficult year uh, financially, thank you for your faithfulness to us here at the church, to God through this church. Let's pray before we move into worship. Bow with me. Father God, we are grateful for the provision that you give to us. At, at this time of year, we are especially mindful of the blessings that you pour out upon us. We're also especially mindful of those who are, who are hurting today. We continue to remember our friends in Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, all through that region who are just reeling today from the devastation of those multi-state tornadoes. We pray for them. We give uh, of uh, your blessings to us, to them. And we pray that you are uh, with them, giving them strength today. As we gather here to continue the celebration of the Advent season, we pray that your spirit would uh, fall richly upon this gathering. Inhabit our worship and praise. Fan into a flame once again the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that you may be praised that we may be revived. We ask this with great humility in your precious name. Amen. Hey, stand and worship with us if you want to. Sit if you want to. We want you to be comfortable. We're just glad you're here today. Let's worship together.
Raise your hand if you know somebody that this time of year is gut-wrenching, like so hard. Maybe they've lost somebody. I know a few. Raise your hand if you know somebody who may not know how much they can afford to give their babies for Christmas. Yeah. Name somebody who's hurting this morning and you're just so glad you made it here. You know why? Because this world's very hard sometimes. The second we convince ourselves, man, I'm doing so good. Look at me, I feel so much better. Life comes and just knocks us at our knees. And it couldn't, it could just be in your own head. It could just be your own emotions, your hormones, whatever the case may be. Let me just tell you, it's valid. If you're hurting right now, you're not even sure why you're hurting. God doesn't need for you to figure it out. God doesn't need for you to sit there and try to figure out what's going on. What he needs from you is surrender. This whole weekend, I was so frustrated and I was mean to my family because I couldn't figure out what was going on. Lord, why do I feel like this? Why do I feel exhausted? Because this season is just hard. As much as it is beautiful, it's busy. So this morning, I pray you would join me in, in just basking in his presence. That's all he asks of us. Don't, don't get it twisted. All he asks is us to meet him. Let's just continue to praise him because he is so good and he is so worthy. Father, the 
Lucy Seeger. Uh, as the kids are coming up to, to sing their special for us this morning, first of all, I want, I want to recognize someone who's one of my dearest friends and is celebrating a birthday today. Happy birthday, Stephanie Skiba. <laughs> special day for her, and we appreciate her so much and hope you have a blessed and wonderful day. Let's, let's thank God for his blessings. Father, we are so grateful for these children. We are so grateful for the music. We are so grateful for our church. We're so grateful for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us bountifully, God, and we are. We are forever. We are forever yours. And Father, your promises and your, and your, and your commands, we say yes and amen. We long to follow you and to love you and to serve you. I ask your blessing and anointing on these children as they sing for us this morning. I ask your blessing and anointing on this congregation as we receive. And I thank you for the opportunity that we have to give and to share. And I ask you to take our offerings of praise, thanksgiving, money, time, sacrifices that we make. Lord, take and multiply and use them for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Y'all are rock stars. All right, come on down. Let's do children's bread. Ron, how are y'all today? You're in you're in rare form, sounding good, right? Oh, the older I get, the harder that gets. Um, good morning. How's everybody down here? Come on up where you can see. There you go. Stand right there. Very good. We got a bag. Got a bag. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody? Got galoshes on there, good job, Lyndon. Uh, it's raining outside. Um, you think it's gonna be a white Christmas this year? You think it's gonna snow this year? It's gonna snow somewhere. Never snows, does it? Closest we get. It only snowed once here. Okay, you say so. All right, so this is the deal. Every week, the, one of the kids brings in a bag, and in the bag uh, is whatever they want to put. Uh, I don't know what's in the bag. They have two rules, nothing living, nothing dead in the bag. And uh, they give it to me, I take it out, and I make a spiritual application with it. Now, whoever gets the bag next week, who, had, who brought the bag this week? Did you bring the bag? Y'all brought the bag? I don't know what's in the bag. We're going to find out. You ready to find out? Let's see. So a girl brought it this week. I'll try to give it to a boy to bring it next week. How's that for fair? Is that fair? All right, so what's going to be next week? Next week is going to be pajamas and Pop-Tarts, right? So, yeah, buddy, it's right there. Bring your, uh, bring your, bring your pajamas. Wear your pajamas. Don't just bring them. And um, we'll have some Pop-Tarts for you and other assorted things to make the rest of your day interesting for your parents. And uh, we'll have a big time that day after Christmas. Let's see what we've got today. Today we've got, ooh, what is this? Stickers. Yeah, everybody loves stickers, right? That bag's getting away. Everybody loves stickers. Y'all see the stickers? And these stickers say, just be you, shine bright, express yourself, be inspired. Very politically correct stickers we have this morning. Um, love them. They're nice. Beautiful, beautiful stickers. I really like those things. What do we do with stickers? Put them on something. Preferably not something that's valuable other than ourselves. But we can take these and we can like stick them on coloring books. Maybe we could even put them like... Uh, hold on. Put it where? No, not on your car. Negative. <laughs> negative. Negative. First of all, you ain't got no car. <laughs> not my car, which is why you're not going to put them on a car. Because it ain't yours. All right? I don't put one right. Not on your dad's car either. There you go. That one right there. Huh? Not me. Not you. No, we're not going to put it on you. Here's the thing. Okay. All right. Listen, listen, all right. So we've got stickers because we're, they're really, really... Would you, like, would you like to come do this? Would you like to come up here and do this? You want to come do it? Come on. No, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. See? See? You talk a good game, and then it's like you back out. You know I'm kidding you, don't you? No. No, he says no. Lyndon's in our FP Kids program. Lyndon, uh, Lyndon I, I just got to tell you, he was giving me down the road a couple of weeks ago. I'm standing in the hallway, and I usually go in and read to them on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And that morning, I had a meeting or something. I wasn't able to be there. And Lyndon's the last one here, and he's standing flat-footed there in the hall. Saying, you come on down. You got to come down. You missed everything. And just giving me the, bad, the glad news because I didn't come read. That was not a fun day when Brother David doesn't show up, is it? Lyndon and I, Lyndon and I get along pretty good. Pretty good. What? It's a good day? All right. So this is the thing about stickers. Let's get back to the stickers. Stickers have an announcement, don't they? Like the one I just put on me. What does that say? Shine bright. I forgot what it said already. Stickers give a message. You put the sticker on, it gives a message. Shine bright. Be inspired. All of those things. Guess what? You and me, we're kind of like stickers for God. Did you know that? We're kind of like stickers for God. Because when we go out and we go around all the time, we're giving messages about what we believe about God. Did you know that? We're giving all kinds of messages about what we believe about God. If we're mean, does that give a good message about God? If we're unkind, does that give a good message about God? No. So we want to be sweet. We want to be gentle. We want to be loving because that is what God calls us to be. But we are like stickers, so everybody that sees the way we act sees Jesus. 
So be very, very careful about how you act, right? Because we want to be sure that we're keeping with our message, with Jesus' message, not giving one of our own. Okay? Very good. Let's take some time to pray. Get your praying hands up. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Get as close as you can without flipping over the altar rail. Here we go. Dear God, we love and thank you that you give us a message to give to other people. It's a message of love and hope, and it's a message that we love to give all year round, but especially at Christmas time. I ask your blessings upon the kids that are here today. Teach them that message and let them always shine it through. Bless their homes and their families, bless their schools and their teachers, and bless this church as we teach them how to follow you. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. All right, what young man would like to bring this next week? Uh, Jackson, I gave it to you last week. You guys get it all the time. Him, huh? when, when somebody new, somebody new. Bring it next. You want to bring it next week? You can. Absolutely. Put something in there. Huh? Y'all want the stickers? Um, all you are doing is ensuring that you are not going to get the stickers. That's all you do. All right, come on, come on, come on. Miss Jamie, here's the stickers. That's why she gets paid the big bucks. Come on down, come on down. Didn't lose any. Thank you, Miss Jamie. All right, there they go. Golly. That's why young people have children right there. Right? Not for old people. Hey, uh, hope you had an awesome weekend. My weekend shaped up pretty good. I spent um, some time with my son who is, is home on military leave, thankfully. Uh, spent Friday evening with several hundred of my closest friends at the movie theater out at Pier Park watching the new Spider-Man. Uh, any Marvel fans in the house? People like Marvel? Yeah, there we go. Spent uh, Friday night watching that new Spider-Man movie. I'm not going uh, to give anything away. Uh, if, you're, if you're into that, you, you know uh, what I'm talking about. It's, you don't want to let people know what happens because something cool might happen or something uncool might happen. I'm, so I'm watching the Marvel movie and I'm watching Spider-Man. And, um, uh, it, it, it's really neat, but if you're a true Marvel fan, one of the things that you've missed over the past couple of movies is the absence of one particular Easter egg that was in almost every Marvel movie. And that is a cameo appearance by a guy named Stan Lee. Everybody know who Stan Lee is? Stan Lee is the guy that created Spider-Man. He is the Marvel man, if you will. He created not only Spider-Man, but he, he gave life and voice to, to several other uh, Marvel characters. And just a great, great prolific uh, illustrator, idea person. But Spider-Man was his baby. Uh, he, he thought Spider-Man up, brought life into him, and, and turned him one of the most, into one of the most iconic superheroes of, of all time. And what Marvel would do is, at some point in time during, whether it was Iron Man or Spider-Man, whatever the Marvel movie was, he would have a cameo appearance. Uh, one of the last ones I saw him in may even be the last, the, the last appearance he made was in uh, the newer Spider-Man movies. He's, he's waving and talking out the window to a neighbor across the way there. Just a little small thing, and everybody would always look for Stan Lee, but he's since gone on to, to be with the Lord and uh, not able to be in those movies. But still, it, it was really neat to be able to watch the movies and, and see the creator actually there in the movie. I mean, this is the guy who, who, who thought Spider-Man up. And Spider-Man reflects all that stuff, right? All the superhero angst, all of the angst that comes with being a teenager, uh, just etc. The, the whole gamut right there. And, and there in the middle of these movies, there, there's the creator. God kind of does the same thing. But, but the movie is this world, and it's not a movie at all. God sometimes makes cameo appearances here in this world. And we talked a little bit about that in our men's Bible study on Wednesday night when we were talking about God's will. You know, I've, I've shared with you before that, that God, has, God has, has two wills. God has a permissive will and, and God has a perfect will, right? So his permissive will is what gives us free will. 
All right? So God has imbued us with free will. We're made in his image, and, and free will is, is what uh, allowed Adam and Eve to, to choose to eat of the forbidden fruit. That's God's permissive will. Then, then God has a, a perfect will. And his perfect will is ultimately his plan for his creation, his, his humanity. And we said that while you can't put God in a box every once in a while, God shows up in this world. He breaks into our time-space continuum, and he does things decisively for his creation. And that's always with his perfect will. For instance, it was God's perfect will, not his permissive will, that split the Red Sea in two. That, that was God's perfect will that caused that to happen. It was God's perfect will that, that sent his son into this world. That, that wasn't his permissive will. And there, in the midst of it all, the creator shows up. Right in the middle of his creation, just like Stan Lee in the Marvel movies. And he does that in a number of ways all throughout scripture. And one of the most magnificent ways he does that is, is through two women. And really, their stories are the beginning, if you will, of the New Testament. He comes and he sees a, a woman named Elizabeth in a very special way. He talks to her husband, Zechariah, as we read a few weeks ago, and says, Hey, hey, your wife is going to get pregnant. That would have been not a big deal if they hadn't been so doggone old. Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, and you remember Zechariah said, I'm not really sure how this is going to happen. And if you remember, I told you Gabriel used his angelic remote and hit the mute button, right? And Zechariah was quiet for a while, not by choice. And he sends the angel Gabriel to talk to a young woman named Mary. And he begins to, to step into the time-space continuum again and, and bring his perfect will to bear here in this world. And he says to Mary, this is the way this is going to come down. It's the way it's going to shake out. Um, it's not going to be real comfortable for you, but there's a reason. There's a reason. Mary listens. It happens with Elizabeth. And as fate would have it, they're related. They're cousins, Mary and Elizabeth. And, and so they get together and they begin to talk. In the past few weeks, we've been talking. We're in the middle of a sermon series, kind of moving toward the end of the sermon series called Following God Off the Map, We're talking about an Advent journey. We talked about how God is calling us off the map toward a, a different kind of forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ. We talked about how God is calling us off the map toward a new idea of redemption through the person of Jesus Christ. We talked about how God is, is moving us from our positions of comfort to a place that we're not comfortable with, asking us simply to follow him. And we've likened that to Lewis and Clark's expedition. Yeah, they were going to sail all the way to the Pacific Ocean, right? Through the Louisiana Purchase, find that water route until they hit the Rocky Mountains. Canoes had to be burned. Had to think about how is they're going to navigate, become mountain climbers instead of canoe riders to find that water route. And Lewis and Clark had to pull off a feat. They had to convince the people that were with them to follow them off the map. They'd gone as far as they could go. The Rocky Mountains weren't mapped, and they'd hit this wall. And they said, okay, we've got the mission ahead of us. We need to climb until we can figure out what's going to be on the other side of these mountains. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay or are you going to go? And, and they followed Lewis and Clark off the map. And we're going to talk about why they did that in just a few moments. But up until that point, let's talk about following God off the map and how it is that, that he steps into our time-space continuum and how he makes cameo appearances in this world at times to achieve his perfect will and today we're going to do that in the message of Mary that we call Mary is Magnificent talking about not forgiveness not redemption but talking today specifically about justice and deliverance justice and deliverance on the front of your insert 
you can find our scripture reading today. It's going to pop up on the screen as we read along with it. A little set up at first, and then we move into a, a beautiful song by Elizabeth, and then finally, Mary's Magnificent. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 55. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who were proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and to his descendants, just as he has promised our ancestors. And, and there, in this beautiful piece of, of writing, this beautiful verse, Mary reminds us of what's happening here in God's creation, in God's world. It's the same thing that's happening in Spider-Man. It's the same thing that's happening in professional wrestling on TV. It's the same thing that's happening in your life and in my life. Every day of the week, and it is the battle against good and evil. But in Mary's Magnificent, she makes sure that we know and that we understand that what's happening with her is reflected in what God has promised to do in the battle between good and evil long ago through Abraham. You see, God spoke definitively to Abraham thousands of years before Mary and made a promise to him that he would redeem this place. He would redeem his nation, Israel. He would bless the entire world through that nation. And she's just a, just a small part of it. She's just a small part of that deliverance that God had promised. She's just a small part of that justice that, that he had promised to bring into the world. And here and now, through a little teenage girl, it begins to happen. All of this power invested in one tiny, insignificant person. Much like Peter Parker, Spider-Man's story. He was a teenager as she was a teenager. Make no mistake, though. There's nothing really special about Mary. She was a young girl who struggled with the same things that you struggle with and the same things that I struggle with. She had the same problems, though in a different time set. She had the same issues, though in a different time in history, as, as we have all had before. So when we follow God off the map, when God speaks into your life, when God speaks into my life, or perhaps he's yet to speak into your life, or perhaps you've yet to hear him speak into your life. What do we do? That's kind of what I want to speak with you about today. If you're filling in your blanks, let's hit the ground running here. And let me tell you this. When God speaks definitively in your life, when he begins to show that something's going on in you and around you, it, it's, it's fitting for you to fit your journey into God's story. Strive to fit your story into God's journey. Sometimes we get it backwards. Sometimes we want God to fit his story into our life. That's really not the way it works. Really the best thing that you can do, really the best thing that I can do, is do our best to try to figure out who we are in light of what God is doing in this world. Mary says this when she begins speaking to Elizabeth. 
She says, and my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant from now from now on, all generations will call me blessed. She begins to realize that forevermore, her life, her journey is eternally tangled up in God's story. That's significant for you. That's significant for me because we are the same way. How is your story tangled up in what God is doing in this place how does your story fit into what God is doing in this time and place? She acknowledges who she is. She acknowledges her, her humanity. And she says out loud, I'm blessed because of what God has done in and through me. What he's doing in and through me. What is God doing in and through you? It, it requires us to sit up and listen. It requires us to take notice. It requires us to be able to discern with our spirit with the Spirit of God that lives within us, what's happening in this place because of who God is and because of who God is to me, who he is to you. Fit your journey into God's story. It's amazing when we're able to do this because it gives us an, a, a, a superpower, if you will, our faith begins to grow, and we begin to, to reach outside of ourselves and really accomplish more than we could ever accomplish by ourself. And when we look at all of this, we begin to understand Scripture better. Scripture like I've included on your bulletin there, Exodus chapter 15, where it says, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. You see, the same spirit that led the writer of Exodus to include those words is the same spirit that's working in Mary that allows her to say what she has said. It, it's not about me. It's about God. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about what I'm doing for God because God is guiding me. Following God off the map. Taking an Advent journey with him means that, that we become part of his story of justice. We become part of his story of deliverance. Not just for our immediate area, our immediate, our immediate sphere of influence. But in the whole crossword jigsaw puzzle of time, we have a place to fit. That's amazing that God invites us into that. It's amazing that he would take his creation and invite you and invite me right smack dab in the middle of that and say, come and participate with me in this endeavor. Fit your journey into God's story. And, and as you do that, you'll begin to understand what I want to share with you next. You, you'll begin to understand your salvation differently. You'll begin to view your salvation as a kingdom investment. That's tantamount. When we begin to view our salvation as a kingdom investment, we begin to understand a little bit better what Mary was saying. She said, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. When you begin to look at your salvation as something that is beneficial, not just for you, but for the entire world and for what God is doing here and now, you begin to understand, I begin to understand, uh, better and better that what we're doing is bigger than us. It's not about you, as I've already said. It is about God and what he's doing here, what he's doing for you, what he's doing for me, and why he's doing those things. Looking there, we see a couple of pieces of scripture. The first one says this, the sovereign Lord said, it is not for your sake. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. You see, Ezekiel was a prophet. And he was telling the nation of Israel what good was going to happen and what bad was going to happen for the nation of Israel. And he says quite plainly to them, what I'm about to do in the midst of you here and now, it ain't got nothing to do with you. Oh, you're going to be involved. You're going to get caught up in it. 
But what I'm about to do here and now is for me and my name, not for you. So when we say that it's not about us, we really mean it ain't about us. The Psalms make it clear that our purpose is to glorify God in whatever it is that we do that is good and just and right. We glorify Him. So James, when you play the piano and sing, it ain't about James, it's about God. Amen? Okay? When we stand up and we preach, it's not about me, it's about God. When we teach in the children's program, when we work at the church, when we do what we do outside the walls of the church, it's about God and not about us. Why? Because what God is doing in me, what God is doing in you and through you and through me, is about His kingdom. It's about following Him off the map and doing what He's called us to do. We can't do that bringing all of this baggage with us. So He works in us and He begins to sanctify us and, and He begins to help us to lay that baggage down, those racist mindsets those sexist mindsets, those violent tendencies, those desires for things impure, these things, the more we get to know God, these things begin to fall away. And we literally become more and more like Jesus and become more useful to him in his kingdom. First Peter kind of echoes the same thing. Chapter 2 says, You are royal priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's special treasure. You are all these things so that you can give him praise. Bottom line, following God off the map means taking more responsibility. Following God off the map means becoming more and more like him so that we can become more and more of him. Just like I was speaking to the kids about. What kind of sticker are you showing off? I cringe when I see Jesus fish on cars. You know why? Because when you stick a Jesus fish on your car, you're speaking for me too. Um, and I've got an issue with that. That's why there ain't no Jesus fish on my car. That's why there ain't nothing on my car that can identify me other than my tag number. You know why? Because sometimes I lose those battles driving down 23rd Street. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, too. Sometimes, sometimes that battle is fought within me, and uh, what uh, the New Testament says happens. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> and I don't need anybody identifying what I do when I'm upset with who Jesus is to me. Mm, so when we talk about a kingdom investment, we talk about what we do outside the walls of the church, not just what we do inside the walls of the church for an hour or two every week. You're living out your Christianity means more than just this. This is important. You heard Karen say earlier, she, she ran down the, the church uh, mission statement, right? Acceptance, hope, and purpose. Accepting people where they are. Providing them the hope of Jesus. Bringing them to a point of purpose. Not our purpose for them, but Jesus' purpose for them. So it's important that that is achieved here, but it's more important that it's lived out there. Because this is part of God's kingdom in all of God's kingdom. When you're saved, don't engage in escapism. Look at your salvation as a kingdom investment. Lastly, we'll get back to something we were talking about earlier. Lastly, Engaging in this, this trip off the map with God, looking for this new idea of justice, this new idea of deliverance. Mary moves from acknowledging what God is doing in and through her to acknowledging what Abraham or what God had promised to Abraham long ago. And, and you have to understand that she would have, she would have understood the promises uh, intimately that God had made to Abraham. She had learned them in her study of scripture. 
all Jewish kids had. Look up the idea of Midrash, M-I-D-R-A-S-H. Sometime when you've, when you've got just a couple of minutes you want to burn. Look up the idea of Midrash, the, the practice, the, the school of Midrash. You'll understand that all Jewish children for a while underwent the teaching of Scripture in Jesus' this time. Mary knew intimately what God had promised to Abraham and what God had promised to the nation of Israel. So you see her moving from this idea of what God's doing in her to what he's about to do in the interest of justice and deliverance for the nation of Israel through her. So we respond, just like Mary, with faith and obedience. She continues in her Magnificat. She says, he has promised mighty deeds. He has scattered those who are proud. He has brought down rulers. He has filled the hungry. He has helped his servant Israel just as he promised to our ancestors. So what does your faith stand on? See, your faith doesn't stand on just your idea of who God is. Your faith, my faith, my faith, your obedience stands on what God has done before on our behalf and on behalf of the nation of Israel in keeping those promises. We, we're not building our hopes on a, a, a foundation, a, a, a bedrock of, of sand, if you will. We're building our foundation on what God has done, the promises that he's fulfilled. So when we look at this idea of faith and when we look at this idea of obedience, we keep the mindset of Mary. We look not at what we have done or what we think we're capable of. We look at what he has done and what he is capable of. And I, I, it's hard sometimes to maintain the faith and obedience. I, I spend an inordinate amount of my time a blessed amount of my time, but an inordinate amount of my time talking with you and members of this community about the difficulties that they're having in their life. And I'm no exception. There are difficulties in my life too. Life is unfair. You've heard me say that before. Life this side of heaven, man, it stinks sometimes. Life this side of heaven is unjust. It seems like there is no deliverance. I, I know your stories. I know your stories of, of physical maladies, and the physical maladies of your children. I, I know your stories about uh, the injustice when a, when a parent outlives a child. I, I know your stories of struggle with addiction. I know your stories of sexual abuse. I, I know these things that are unfair, and I know that when life kicks you again and again and again, this idea of responding with faith and obedience gets hard. And there's a reason we've got these bears in here right now, <laughs> and that's because life is unfair. And when life is unfair to a child, the earth wobbles on its axis. And the closer we get to Jesus' return, the more it seems like this world is set on a permanent vibration, if you will. The truth is, life is unfair. And when life is unfair, it is hard to respond with faith and obedience. So what's the purpose? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I've got nothing for you other than what I've already told you. That life this side of heaven leaves a lot to be desired at times. But this is what I do know. That you can take whatever it is that life hands you. I can take whatever it is that life hands me and I can do something with it if I respond in faith and obedience to what God is doing in me and with me. And we see that. It's reflected in 2 Corinthians. This is a mandate for those of you who are hurting now. This is a mandate for those of you who have been through struggles. This is a mandate for the follower of Christ that has had Christ minister to them in times of difficulty. It says this, let us give thanks to God, to the God and 
Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful Father, the God from whom all help comes. And, and listen to this. He helps us in all our troubles so that we are able to help others who have all kinds of troubles using that same help that we ourselves have received from God. Do you hear that? Do, do you hear that? It gives no explanation for why what life is unfair. It gives no explanation for why this happens or that happens. It gives no explanation for hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes. It gives no explanation for why parents outlive their children. It gives no explanation for cancer. It gives no explanation for alcoholism or drug addiction. What it says is when this happens, receive what God has to give you so that you can become part of his justice and his deliverance for somebody else that's going through the same thing. Because I guarantee you this, as unfair as this life is to you, it's just as unfair to your neighbor. And one day, one day, they're going to need you. And we have the ability to comfort others with the same comfort that we have received from God himself and thereby become his hands and his feet and his salt and his light to them. So stop asking why and begin to ask, what can I, through the power of Christ that lives within me, learn from this and do about it? that I might lean on him and allow him to sustain me so that I might become part of his plan. So that I might become part of his cameo appearance here in this time-space continuum. So that I might become part of his awesome power and share it with others that they may know his hope and his comfort firsthand through us to them. Pray with me. Lord, it's, it's hard to pray that. It's so hard to pray that. It's hard to follow you off the map. We, we don't know what you're doing sometimes, Father. And sometimes we're going to get upset, and sometimes we're going to get upset with you. I'm thankful that you can take it. Today, Father, as we talk about becoming, becoming part of your justice and your deliverance, as we talk about becoming part of the fulfillment of your promise, to the nation of Israel to bless this world through your son Jesus. Give us the power to live every moment with hope that we might become harbingers of that hope for people who think they can't live one more moment. Oh, that's our desire. Make us real. Make us your real presence in this place for your love for your mercy and your grace to be shown in this world not just at Christmas time but all the time and all for your glory all for your honor hear our prayer Lord we ask it in that sweet and precious name Amen. Friends, the altar is open. If you need to come forward and pray, please feel free to do so.
Thank you, Stephanie. Would you stand for the benediction, please? Again, we're honored by your presence today. Please make sure that you fill out your connection cards, drop them in the offering plate along with your offering. Receive this blessing as you move into the world. Go into the world to do exactly what we've been talking about. To be so filled with the Holy Spirit that, that we become part of what God is doing here and now. Not for us, but for His kingdom and for His glory. Do this. Do this with the love of God, with the peace of Christ, and with the power of the Holy Spirit moving you forward. In His precious name, amen. Thank you for coming.